live and recording. Hello, Karen. Hello. Hi, Chris. Christopher. <laughs> Makes the distance seem really small. We got the Pacific Ocean between us. I'm in Hawaii, and you're on the coast of California, the Bay Area. I'm pretty much looking directly your way right now. So. <laughs> Hello. Uh, this is. Uh, yeah, and thank you to everyone. So what we're going to be talking about today is a webinar about, um, about intimacy, particularly how uh, polarity between the different energies can be used to keep it hot and interesting, um, to either attract a new partner if you don't have one and you would like to have one, or to keep the one you have um, not just interested, but make it fun and deep over the long term. Um, so Karen approached me, we've actually met through some of this work. Um, we've been doing a lot of training outside of our normal professional routines. And what we're talking about today is not therapy per se, but we're actually going into um, what my teachers have called a yogic art. It's, it's actually using your body and using your heart and your emotional energy of who you are and how do you communicate that through your body to another person and um, so a lot of be about your questions we'll start off with a little bit of introduction into what we're actually talking about first but i encourage you all to raise your hands um, if you're on join on the webinar and you're live right now we got a few people um, there's a little button at the bottom that says hand you can touch that and you'll get a um, it'll raise an indication to Karen and I that there's a question or a comment and we'll be able to interact with you. You can also select the Q&A button and type in a question for us to address and you can do that anonymously or you can identify yourself. It's a little checkbox if you want to do it anonymously. Um, it's fine either way. So um, the more of those we have, the better. Um, we'll also ask if you're attending far left there's a mute button so if you would uh, click on that unless you want to be um, on the audio and um, asking questions but feel free if you want to interact with us um, again raise your hand you can unmute yourself and we can actually do a live uh, question that way all right yeah and if you're on facebook you can ask us questions i'm not sure um, I think questions, but you can also, you know, private message me or Christopher um, so that we can have this be a very interactive conversation. Um, we want to know what you're curious about, what your questions are. We want us to, you know, bring your skepticism. I came to this work very much kicking and screaming, <laughs> so I appreciate a skeptical mind. Um, even if it's not always to deal with, but I invite that as well. Uh, I think it makes for interesting conversation. And this is a little bit of an edgy topic um, for the current, for our time right now, for, the, for the, the climate that we're in and with men and with women, um, even to be using the words masculine and feminine um, can bring up a lot of feelings. So I, I, I invite all of that. We invite all of that. Um, and if you're listening to the recording, um, you know, send, send us your questions as well, or bring them to our live events that are happening in the Bay Area, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. Let's just introduce, we'll start off with, um, just dive right into a couple charged words, masculine and feminine. So when we talk about these, um, we're actually drawing on a body of work created decades ago by um, one of my dear teachers, David Data, using language um, to actually connect and deepen instead of um, separate. So let's talk about the terms masculine and feminine just a little bit. Um, in the ancient 
Chinese Taoist tradition, we'd maybe say yang and yin, um, but that's really not our culture here. Um, so let's talk about as primal energies, the things that actually can be attractive. Um, just look at the difference between our two bodies here a little bit. So I'm just naturally a little bit more inhabiting the masculine. Karen's pretty radiant. She's got a lot of light coming through her. She's moving even just a little bit. She's got a fireplace in the back. We, we didn't plan it this way. It's just when I'm, when I'm really attentive, I get rather still and I tend to uh, appreciate the beauty around me. Um, it's me in the witness position. So in the masculine, the part of us, you know, we all have masculine feminine parts of us in this language we're talking about. Um, the part of you is the witness, the part of you that is the unchanging observer, almost sounds too simple, but it's really important to point this out. Um, we all have that. It's the part of ourselves that was maybe the same when you were a child or a teenager or um, when you woke up this morning, it was kind of you aware of maybe brushing your teeth um, or you were aware that you were logging into the webinar. So that would be your masculine. And it, when you're in the masculine, you tend to come to more stillness and you're kind of watching and then appreciating. Um, the feminine is everything that changes or moves. Um, and then from that perspective, then it's it would be our bodies because they're breathing, they're respirating, they're, they're always growing and dying, or consuming food, we're metabolizing oxygen. Um, the beautiful Hawaii that I'm looking out over my shoulder here at the window is profoundly feminine with all the flowers, the movement of the wind through the palm trees outside, the ocean spray, there's whales jumping, right as I'm looking at Karen kind of over the back out the window. Um, it's life itself is always moving and changing and there's something attractive when you're the witness that kind of loves seeing that movement and that light and why do people come to Hawaii for vacation? It's nourishing. It, it tends to pull you out of maybe the place of um, being lost in subjective perseveration of what's going on inside ourselves. Um, maybe that's the heart of what um, some of this tantra that we're talking about is, is that when we're in a charged sexual situation, um, it pulls us out of this kind of heavy feeling of being um, inwardly directed and looking at what we're thinking, what we're feeling all the time. And it brings us into contact with something greater, something potentially outside of ourselves, but there's also this sensation of feeling of fullness and um, more vibrant aliveness. Now you, you could sit, achieve this sitting on a cushion by yourself if you're a masculine practitioner in a practice, or you could um, maybe achieve that feeling of fullness and ecstasy um, dancing with some friends and be more of a feminine type expression. Um, but just with that simple definition of say, the witness and then everything that is actually arising and being. Um, we kind of jump in with the masculine and feminine that way, but it doesn't have to be assigned with your gender. It's really specific. So, um, but the fun of a polarity or energized situation when you're feeling a lot of attraction, there's usually that difference. Someone's playing the pole of, of being very trustable and the witness, and then someone's playing the, the pole of, uh, I am this, I am this energy, this life force itself. So, Karen, anything to yeah. add to that? Because that's, again, probably my masculine perspective of this. I'd be curious on how you um, heard those terms and, and how they arise even in your practice, you know. Yeah, I, I, I... I, I I really resonate with the the idea of the feminine of of that which is ever changing and moving and is the the perfect example um, the weather and then the masculine is that which is <clears throat> unchangeable and 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 
and you know, deep, deep witness. Um, and as a therapist, I'm in the masculine a lot. Um, it's, it's been a very, to practice letting myself be more in my feminine by letting, and, and letting that come out through my body, right? So letting my body move and letting myself kind of like dive into emotion um, through, through my body, through my expression, through what I'm wearing. Um, and it, there's something about, for me, I think I grew up thinking I was more, I think that had you asked me when I was in my twenties, if I identified more in the masculine or the feminine, although I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cisgendered, like I'm a heterosexual cisgender woman. Um, I think I still identified more with the masculine because I was very used to using like the, my left brain to figure stuff out, to be analytical, you know, to science and straightforward. But that was, that I learned that that was actually more of a coping mechanism of mine. The strength that got co-opted into it being, it got exploited as a coping mechanism. It wasn't my core. And so I found that I, I, I'm more feminine at the core in the sense of, of when I drop in, being in deep presence definitely nourishes me, but, but, I'm more nourished by letting myself be in, in the feminine and move and be unpredictable. And it's very scary for me, very scary for lots of reasons. Um, one of which being the feminine is not validated in our world. Um, I think nature is what you're saying around Hawaii is a perfect example. I think of um, uh, this uh, 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 author, Clarissa Pinkola Estes, she wrote, um, many things, but among them, women who run with the wolves um, and myths of the of the dangerous old woman, or sorry, the dangerous old woman myths of the the wise woman myth. And she talks about a neighbor she had who was constantly yelling at her for how her flowers would fall in in the neighbor's yard, and and they were they were beautiful, but they were messy. And she was saying, well, that's, that's, that's the feminine in us. The feminine is that which the, you know, the flowers are falling and they're messy and they're beautiful, but this neighbor wanted everything tight and the, you know, this, and this is yours. And we're going to, and she actually said, she told this sad story that she cut, the neighbor cut this beautiful bush that she had because she was so, she was so sort of, uh, so much friction around the feminine. So. You know, I think that, that, that that's just one example of how the feminine shows up in nature and in us, the sort of like chaotic, unpredictable beauty. Um, but I have found that when I am not bringing my feminine in relationship, a few things happen. You know, as someone who was more, was more sort of conditioned to be in my masculine, and then I chose a profession that while I'm being with emotion, which is quite, the emotion is feminine, I'm being in the sacred, sacred masculine role, um, holding space for the emotion to come up. And especially starting by working with children and children are the penultimate feminine. Just emotion comes, arises, they have a big tantrum and then it's over and now they're ready for lunch. And you're like, what the, what the F just happened? Um, so I was in my masculine, but then in, in relationship, I would, I would control my partner. I would not be turned on. I, and I would, and then I would sort of with brains, you know, let's go here. Let's at this time. Um, okay. We're going to be late. Let's get in the car. I'm, I'm to tell you the directions. And then I would get resentful that he <laughs> wasn't leading and that there was no electricity. You, you know, there was, I was, I was, it was like we, I even had one relationship where we created so much beautiful safety with one another. And there was a lot of deep traction because there was polarity. And, you know, I'm sure there were things that he could have been doing, but just from my own perspective, when I started doing work on allowing my feminine and actually 
practices, specific practices to, to uh, drop into my feminine, my feeling, body, pleasure, um, expression of chaos with myself, with partners, then things started to shift in pretty dramatic ways. So explain. So I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I mean, people who are watching right now can see the light <laughs> coming through you as you're talking about that. So she's actually getting more and more energized as she was talking. Um, can you share with us like one of those practices that really shifted something for you? And, and so people understand what we mean by even a practice, but what did you personally do? How much time did you dedicate to it? And what did you experience? Oh gosh, there's so many. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, big, a big one for me is, is, is pleasure practice. So for me, what I have done the, is around anywhere from just five minutes Many times a week as I can, any, anywhere from like three to five um, is what I've typically done, where I put on different songs that will evoke different emotions. Like I sort of tap into what do I think that I'm needing to feel? Not really like what do I want to feel? Yeah. Avoiding is, is part of it. What am I avoiding, but also what will nourish me? There's this sort of combination. And, and then I'll just lay on a yoga mat and I'll let myself breathe and move with my eyes closed in whatever way feels, feels nourishing, feels right in that moment, in whatever way my body wants to. And it, so it, it could be that I'm um, sort of just rocking my pelvis slowly and taking deep breaths and letting myself melt into the mat. Um, maybe I put on sort of a sensual song and, and, you know, let my fingertips touch my skin. Feel like sort of the softness of the carpet, just focusing on anything that feels good. That's the pleasure part, just putting your focus on what feels good. Uh, maybe there's some stuck sadness, so I'll put on, I've been putting on the Mumford and Sung song, I Will Wait. Um, I, feel, I feel like they can always evoke <laughs> tears and <clears throat> just like, you know, hit the ground or throw a pillow or yell. I'll even tell my, I even tell my roommate, you know, I'm going to do some cathartic practices and she's, you know, she's gotten used to it and it's like give, gives all, her permission to be wherever she's at too. So, so whether it's letting myself feel my pleasure or drop into slowness because I've been going, going, going and do. Or cry or rage or feel longing, um, you know, sort of letting myself, letting these different, the energies, the different, the, if the feminine is all of the different energies that, that can exist, then, then embodying some of those um, for a you know, few minutes a day. That's, that's just one practice that comes up. For so my, uh, my wife. Well, and it's actually taken me out of, it's been one of the main things. Oh, sorry. Sorry, we had a little digital lag. I was, I was gonna say that's- really Things that's taken me actually out of adrenal fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. No, the movement and um, actually just, kind of allowing that emotional body to be acknowledged and to literally move through the physical body is huge. Um, I would say then some of my work with clients, that's been um, a huge part of this tension we carry around because we're trying to make our way through the world and a lot of coming into competency as a human being is being able to embody both the masculine and the feminine. So like you said, you've got a, a business, you um, show up on time, you work with children, you're holding a lot of space and structure for that. And yet that's kind of lean into being that um, more of the conscious presence, holding structure for people. And you can feel how it's almost accumulating physical tension in the body. It wants to move, it wants to be released. Um, and, and what you found with the, movement and the dance practice sounds 
ridiculously simple, but it's it's really nourishes this whole body. Um, I, I know in the masculine side, for instance, masculine practice is uh, classically for me then meditation, uh, being able to sit still and allow any emotions, thoughts to arise, um, learning to be in that deep pocket of peace and no, no big deal, whatever comes up, no matter what the emotion is. Um, allowing that to happen in my own body has given me the capacity to stay present with my feminine partner, uh, who's a physical feminine being, my wife, um, with whatever emotion is moving through her. Um, and I would say that the practices in some of the, the sitting meditation that I've done in the Buddhist tradition has translated into a, a very skilled technique in terms of touch and that moves into say massage i'm not a trained masseuse or any means by that but just in terms of bringing more conscious awareness into how i touch my partner with my hands um not as thought but as feeling awareness has made a huge difference huge difference in them feeling seen received and felt. Uh, this is my daughter phoning. Uh, so obviously she was kind of feeling this on the call here right now. Oh, there's some feminine <laughs> right there. <laughs> Multiple levels. Uh, that, that's just an introduction into some of the practice we're doing. I'd really love a, a question if there's anyone. Uh, looks like we have Joe. Hello, welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. And John, um, any particular question you'd like to ask uh, Karen or myself or both of us? Um, you type it in, just like I said, click on the Q&A button and we'll receive that. We'd love to uh, mm -hmm. make it more interactive. It's really where the, uh, the heart of this work happens. Yeah. And if you're on Facebook, you can um, you know, make a comment or um, send us a, a message with your questions, we'd love to hear. I, I, I know that I, I would love to hear more about how, how you have you a little more, I know you shared a bit, but about how you've used masculine practices and, and the polarity of masculine and feminine in, in your relationship with your wife to keep things alive, to, you know, continue to deepen in intimacy yeah. and what that looks like. I would say in, in terms of practice, it's, it's almost blurred into a continual um, time when we're together. So like even just this morning, I was walking through the bedroom saying hello to her and I could tell that she was still a little achy from some gardening work we did yesterday and um, my hands just moved to where I was feeling that muscular tension in her back and the amount of release she felt just from me seeing and acknowledging um, that she was achy a little bit. Um, there wasn't anything I had to do other than just place my hand on that part of her back. So the fact that I was even aware, I wasn't lost in my own internal subjective experience worrying what I had to get through the day, which a lot of us do. It's just, I was open and taking her into account, um, shifted something this morning. And then I'll give you another moment, was uh, a little bit later, um, she was doing a little yoga, I walked by and my posture was slouching and it was kind of making her a little nauseous. So she just lovingly kind of touched my belly and I realized that I had I was kind of slouching and it was a really annoying her, um, but it wasn't a big deal. It was just something that happened. And I lengthened my spine and stood up a little bit more and it's all nonverbal by the way. And she just audibly sighed. She went, ah, yeah. And it just, just smiled at me um, in a way that totally warmed my morning. It was a couple little moments that didn't take a lot of effort but they reaffirmed that connection that I am 
aware of her. I appreciate her. Um, she's aware of me, appreciates me. We're, whenever you're even moving to the house, you're always interacting with each other's space and you're affecting each other's body. So the yoga component of this is how I show up as a man inhabiting consciousness in my body. It affects everyone around me. And I've had that taught to me over and over and over, um, particularly when I've invited feedback from men or women who've been around. But there's a real wisdom in a lot of this work that I've learned from David Data or Sophia Diaz, other teachers, um, that we affect the world around us in how we, um, how relaxed and open we are in our own body. If you walk through the airport, you see someone who is really in a foul mood and kind of grumbling underneath their breath. You want to like step away from them. There's almost a, a cloud like the old, uh, I don't know, Charlie Brown pig pen character. There's sort of a field that surrounds someone when they're in a, in a place of, you know, lost in, I would say, heavier emotions. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's, it's if they're kind of collapse into themselves and feeling separate. And I would say this, this yoga of staying in relationship with other people, particularly an intimate partner, um, calls you out of that being lost in your inner loneliness, uh, your inner emotions. Um, they have a different context when you realize you're actually affecting the space around you and you're affecting your partner. And you get to choose then how you would like to actually, um, what kind of effect you want to have on them. Like as love, literally. So I, I my wife's birthday was uh, a couple days ago and I set aside a day to just kind of nourish and spoil her rotten. And so thinking of, you, know, you would do this for maybe anyone you loved if it was their birthday, but Literally, what would it take to nourish their body? What kind of food would they really love? What, um, what kind of clothing would help free them a little bit? So, you know, to even have her go through trying on a few things and then, oh my God, just witness how beautiful she is in that and to raise the hell out of it because it makes my day. But her hearing how I see her and how she's lighting my world up it lit her up and we spent just the day kind of moving through that kind of space. It, 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 it I mean, we've been married for, I guess, going on um, eight years. And I can say honestly that not just the love, but the sexual attraction we have between each other continues to deepen. Um, it hasn't slowed down like it does in most intimate relationships and I would say most of that's due to um, not getting lost in my own meanness <laughs> and staying in touch with how I'm affecting everything around me and making a choice. Not, not, it doesn't like take anything away from me to um, be able to be aware of her presence and notice um, and she's beautiful, like just something with her hair. If it, if it causes any spark inside of me to be able to give words to that. Um, literally, it doesn't cost me anything just to say a few things. But the effect over the long term of someone being seen and appreciated is profound. It, 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 particularly for feminine beings, I would say. And then, you know, for a masculine being myself, um, to be trusted, to have, to have my partner feel that uh, I'm really someone that she can turn to with whatever emotion is going through her, whatever, whatever problem is, um, whatever um, issues happening with her parents or her children, that I can be there with that. And there, there's a depth of being able to meet the intensity of whatever emotion she's feeling, whatever um, the physical situation demands. There's something about a, that masculine isn't just the witness, 
I see it, but there's, because your heart is engaged, you're actually moved into action often. And, and, and that's where that, that power and force of it kind of comes through. Yeah, I, I, I love hearing those examples, how you bring love to your wife in those moments. And I found that when you shared about just to just touching her back, you know, so simple. There's there's something in me that feels feels this like grief and and relief at the same time. For like, it's it's like the the for the masculine to really see the feminine. Whether whether it's you know a, a woman a woman seeing a man or a man you know it doesn't matter gender, but in particular the masculine in a man seeing the feminine pain in a, a female bodied person, that combination is so deeply healing. You know, from, from just from the gentle touch to be seen as well as what you're saying around sort of being present and called to action for her big emotion. I can't tell you how many women I meet who, who just literally do not believe it is possible to be, let their anger out at their man, um, not, you know, in front of their man, I should say, not at, but in front of their man, and have it be met with love. And, and the first time that I had that experience, it of course brought up all the, all the old anger, everything that, you know, that I, I wasn't allowed to feel. So it wasn't all for him, but the fact that he could stand there and listen and, and take it, knowing that it wasn't about him, you know, that there was only a small amount that was about him and to meet me in love, it, it's like it broke open something in me. And so to just, to hear you say how you practice, it sounds like so easy and I'm imagining it's not always easy. <laughs> imagining that's a, that's like a, a function of, of what a deep practitioner you are, that you, that you, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of curious about the times when it's not easy. Um, and, and I also see that we have a question, so I want to make sure we get to that too. But, but yeah, those times that, that you know, you, you're using these practices, but it's, it's not easy, or you're resisting, or you just, you're just irritated with her, <laughs> you know, and how to move through that and, and continue to create that intimacy that you said, you know, you're, it's getting better. Not, it's not, you know, there's this myth that like in long-term relationships, the, the, the spark goes down. And what I hear you saying is not only is it not going down, but it's, it's like getting better. Yeah. So we'll just touch on that and we'll get to the question next. So like, how do I respond when it's not easy? So, right. So there's, there's a lot of times when it's not as simple as your partner's got a, an achy back and you can be sort of the loving hero, put your hand on it. Um, what about when you've screwed up and maybe you overdrew the checking account or you've made some horrible error and she's really, really mad at you. Um, and in those moments, um, I would say some of the deepest Buddhist practice that I've done in meditation, um, it's really invaluable um, to find that place of freedom as consciousness. So I'm, I'm hearing that I'm, my gut is turning into knots because I've done something wrong and I've hurt my partner. I don't want to hurt my partner. Nobody does. And there's like a pattern of, from my childhood of particularly beating up on myself inside if I make an error, right? So the, the childhood pattern gets kind of triggered. I can watch that. Um, the, Chogam Trungpa is a most brilliant Buddhist teacher, and one of his classic sayings, he would, he would tell his students over and over again, um, no big deal. Whatever arises, it's always possible to feel that you're actually perfectly okay. And when you allow yourself to identify with all that swirling energy, you're not in that deepest witness position as consciousness. So I, I step into the maelstrom of energy and emotions. Maybe I'm tearful or maybe I'm like 
feel that yelling. Um, I can feel all of that, but if I don't identify as this me that is being persecuted or has to survive, I can I can just fall into that place of 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 deeper presence. And that, in my experience, when I teach men and couples on this, is actually a body knowing, um, particularly the safety of oh. Feel like maybe I'm going to die from being, you know, criticized or whatever, but that's that's the emotional feeling. It's not reality. I'm physically safe, and I can access that by bringing a nice breath into my belly because the breath almost always, when you feel a, a major emotional shock, uh, stops. It, it, your your emotional sense of self is reflected in your breath. So we can yogically work with the breath and physical relaxation in those moments and something shifts. And often I'll have a different kind of creative response. Um, like maybe I'll even admit that I made a mistake and just sit with it and <laughs> instead of jumping like maybe, excuses. maybe I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just feel how my partner's hurting because of my actions. And, and that I'm not gonna die because of it. There's like an inner child or there's an emotional feeling like I'm gonna hit overwhelm and I can't tolerate it. But I've learned from some of this practice that I'm absolutely always okay and perfectly safe if I can return to the body. And particularly there's a practice of circulating that energy. So instead of throwing off this emotion that it seems too much when I'm playing my mask inside, I can actually inhale and breathe and circulate it. And something funny happens is that that energy that's in movement and, and circulating somehow becomes accessible between the two of us in practice. Something that's really anger inducing um, might even lead to a really hot sexual moment um, a few minutes later. Instead of you know friction and two people bumping up against each other, uh, there might be a cathartic release of emotion, or maybe there's a little bit of sexual humor or something that arises out of that, and the energy wants to move somewhere. And it doesn't have to be a inner or outer directed bouncing back and forth and trying to fight with each other. But that's all going on inside of me during those moments. Does that make sense? Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so I'll read. We have a question from Nasser. Nasser John. I have a question for Christopher. I recently listened to a podcast interview with you in which you talked about an awareness practice focused on your posture. In my experience, the more masculine practice I do, the more I feel an almost I feel almost an internal magnet pull into what feels like a more upright position posture. Is this something you're familiar with? What is your posture awareness practice? Great question. That's a good question. So yes, there is a posture awareness practice. Um, the two main areas that I've learned this from, and I'll try to identify the teachers too, so I didn't discover this myself. Uh, I would say the first was um, Reggie Ray is a a Buddhist teacher who was a student of Chogun Trumpas, and he has a great uh, set of practices around meditating with the body. He's got a good book with that same title. And I particularly learned how to do an upright sitting meditation from Reggie, and it involves stacking up the bones inside your body, letting them carry the load. So you would start with, um, and I teach this in workshops and when I'm working with men, but you, you really find this center of mass um, inside your body and it's, it's locating where your, your spine and your bones are. So you would, if you're sitting on a cushion in a classic sitting posture, you would start with your uh, hips on the floor and you would rock your pelvis until you can kind of feel a neutral point where your head is actually kind of 
the highest, you can almost feel a difference. I'm doing it right now. You see my head moving up and down. I, that's just the pelvic tilt. And when the, the pelvis is tilted, where it lengthens just that lower part of the sacrum the most, my head kind of is a little higher in the picture frame. Um, and from there, I would work on feeling my vertebra almost like you're stacking up Jenga blocks, but not through muscular effort. You want to do it through rela relaxation and adjusting the alignment. Um, and I would say the greatest improvement I've received from that was Hatha Yoga. My uh, teacher, Sophia Diaz, is a master Hatha Yoga teacher. And I couldn't feel my body, particularly as a man, I was rather dense. I would kind of throw it around in sports and had a fair amount of injuries because I couldn't feel everything that was going on inside. I love football, I love rugby. I would kind of throw myself around hockey. Um, but there's something very different about just intensifying sensation in the very simple act of keeping my feet on the floor and placing my palms on the floor in a forward fold, you know, bending down, touching your toes. That alone lit up so much information and sensation. Part of me wanted out of it. It was almost too much when I first started doing yoga, hot yoga. And then over time, I realized I could breathe into the sensation and actually conduct and allow, oh, that, that isn't really pain. It's just, good heavens, I'm actually feeling my ribs. I'm feeling, I'm feeling my clavicle. I'm feeling my neck. I didn't realize that I was unconsciously had my chin forward all the time when I was talking because I was trying to lean in to somebody. Um, and where this really kind of shifted was when I started doing some of the workshops with David Data and I got feedback from women about how my posture was affecting them in terms of, you know, is that attractive or unattractive? You know, the difference between if they wanted to even stand in front of me and they were feeling nauseous versus, oh man, that's kind of sexy. Um, I preferred to be more on the sexy side, and that was posture awareness. For me, it was my chin moving back, but I had to get an internal reference to that. I, my, my neck lengthening. Um, so all, going back to the question, is there a lengthening process of spine and, and posture? I would say yes. And it got associated with my partner gets turned on <laughs> and relaxes, and she's happier. And my posture is good. It was kind of a weird thing. It's not like I'm trying to please her, but literally she's happier and the whole space around me changed. And I was doing this while I was also working professionally in an engineering firm, medical devices. And the posture being lengthened and me having a more relaxed breath caused the power that I was conducting through my body to be absolutely visible to everyone at work. And I started getting more and more responsibility. Um, people would just almost turn to you like, because you kind of wield a lot of physical power and presence. Um, that was all kind of in the posture and the relaxation of the breath. Two, two huge items. Um, it affects you know, business, but then you know, women would start noticing me. And, and they were like, comfortable to be around me was the feedback I got. And, and I definitely got more sexual attractive energy from my wife when I, this was happening. So that's very positive self-reinforcing, if you ask any guy. Does that answer it? We could also see if you had any follow-ups on that, uh, John. Yeah, yeah. If you have any follow-ups, raise your hand, and we can also take live questions, too. Um, yeah, hearing, hearing you share about that, it, it reminds me of, of some of the practices I've done in, in the Art of Fearless Intimacy workshops with John Wineland and Kendra Kunov, um, with whom I've been working for the past two years. And when I'm, and I've noticed that it translates into my relationships, that when I'm in a deeply emotional moment, whether it's um, like opening in, in, in orgasm, pleasure or breaking down in like into my inner child shame um, uh, then and, and if my man is sort of 
like I want him feeling me, but if he's sort of like head cocked to the side and like shoulders in, then there's something inside of me that, 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 you know, wants that's repelled. Um, and that doesn't feel, I think it's that it doesn't feel safe and that when, and that contracts actually contracts my central channel. And yet when he, but if he's just like a stone, then that's, then I also don't feel safe because I feel alone. You know, it's like really that, you know, when I, when a man is like, his heart is open, a man in his masculine or a woman in her masculine, but in, in this case, in relationship, it, it, it creates a polarity. And um, we're talk I'm talking about my partners are men. So when he is, has his heart open and relaxed so he can feel along with me, but is, is in a still presence, then I can, I feel like I can move through where, whatever I'm moving through, like, you know, uh, wh whether it's a, a, a peak of pleasure or, or deep pain, and I can let it sort of expand and go to where it needs to go instead of continuing to contract because it's not safe to fully let go. And, and then when I get that experience, then it's like, oh, I can let go. I can surrender more. And I, I want to surrender to my partner. And he wants, he wants that as well, especially sexually. And so, you know, there's something about that posture, but being relaxed at the same time that can evoke that trust. Yes. So I see that Nasser has his hand up. So should we, should we go to him live? Yeah. yeah, okay. So Nasser, we're gonna unmute you now. Hello. Oh, here Hi. We are. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Christopher. Hello. Uh, so my follow up question is about the fact that in my breath in, in the course of my breath practices and in my sort of yoga practices and just body centered, I do authentic movement as well. Um, I have been developing a growing awareness of just certain almost involuntary, like involuntary contractions and movements in my body into certain shapes and positions that often when I'm doing a sit, it started in a sitting meditation practice mm -hmm. where, um, you know, when I first started doing sitting meditation, I'd be very slumped over and have very poor posture and I'm just trying to stay seated for 20 minutes. That's my goal. But over the course of like doing that and having more practice and doing more hatha yoga, all of a sudden having an erect posture was was easier. But then even in a, a stage beyond that, um, I would notice that my spine would just sort of involuntarily become more erect or like my, my posture would involuntarily just reach a certain shape that I hadn't reached consciously myself. And now that's starting to happen more in my day to day, just walking around life where I'm just noticing, Oh, this doesn't feel open enough. And something in me pushes me into a different position that feels more open and more upright. And I'm, I'm just wondering if anyone else has ever experienced that, if you've experienced that, this sort of involuntary, just like magnetic pull into a different position, because that for me is something that I've been experiencing a lot lately. And I just haven't been able to understand that fully or know if anyone else has, has experienced that and to help me understand it. I would say yes. And actually what you're describing is in my experience, kind of the arc of practice. So you might receive instructions into how to sit in a meditative posture, for instance. And there's sort of a, there's a slightly effortful doing. So you're doing the sitting, you're, there's U.S. consciousness is lengthening the spine. But what you're describing is really at the heart of what we're trying to get to in sexual yoga is a felt knowing of that sense of openness. So you touched on it a little bit, it's even beyond words. So words are symbols and ways we're trying to talk about something that's actually a deep knowing that's quite wordless. Um, in, in my experience and in the teaching I've received on this, I would say there's a feeling awareness centered in the heart space. So we have, you know, big gray matter up in the top of our heads that scientists are really looking at for the heart of 
where thinking and consciousness is, but there's also a huge neurological nexus in the heart and solar plexus and the enteric system in the belly and the genitals. And as we move into the sexual yoga practices, um, that nonverbal knowing becomes more pronounced and it's, it, it's a, it's a knowing of something that's happening and you put the right words on it. It's, I felt like more openness and there's sort of an intrinsic draw toward that openness. Mm -hmm. Although you may not be doing it willfully as a person named John. It's almost like it's happening to you. And that's, that's, that's beautiful actually. That, that's the point where teachers give practices and you do them over and over and then until it, something happens. It's like the, the time when a golf swing isn't you rehearsing and thinking it, but you just, it happens through you and the ball goes 300 yards. So that's really, there's something beauty in that. So yes, I would say that's where it's at. And then um, when you've accessed that place of feeling the openness, um, that's in particular where some of this practice can be navigating into the sexual realm. So when we're working with our body and intense pleasures, particularly like in the genitals, um, and we're interacting with another being, you can do solo too, um, navigating into those places of greater openness and kind of following a bit of spontaneity, um, it, it's, it's a lifelong practice and, it, and you can actually move into spaces in a sexual occasion that are beyond what most humans can experience. And, and specifically, I'm talking about the possibility of, for men, transcending ejaculative orgasm and having pretty much an infinite variety and number of non-ejaculatory orgasms if you want. Um, but then there's all this space. If it isn't just an urge to kind of reach a peak and then have it done and go to sleep, what the hell happens and where are you going? And um, most people have no idea. It is beautiful. You can <laughs> you navigate in that space of openness and it's not the urge you have to perform or do anything. It's what's required to kind of keep that openness opening and deepening and, and intensify the energy between you and your partner that's circulating. Thank you. Yeah. How much um, there? Yeah. And, and also this, so what you just talked about, John, and so everyone is listening, this is what Karen and I are going to be doing in some of these workshops. So we've got a, a short evening um, where we're going to be leading some practices where people get a taste of this. So it's one thing to talk about it. Um, when we're actually leading these practices, there's a heck of a lot less talk and it's more of dropping into the body, doing these adjustments to our posture and getting immediate feedback from another person, whether it's a man or a woman in front of you, because um, you can't see yourself. That's the other piece of this, that well, the Tantra involves two. It involves not just you in your body doing something, doing the posture, but receiving your consciousness expands into this other being that you're connected to, and they are exquisitely sensitive of picking up things that you can't see or you can't even feel and they call you into that greater feeling awareness or that greater depth of of knowing consciousness and then the game is really on and it gets very fun and it also gets it, it's it's like you you're also talking john about that openness when you're in it you can almost hear the joy in his voice when he talked about it there's sort of this surprise this wonder um, it's so different than just spending a day with your face crammed into a phone, seeking the next little endorphin rush from someone liking your post. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's a real like expanse through the chest and relaxation you would get like maybe after hanging out on one of these Hawaiian beaches. It's a different thing than being in your mind and in your head. It's a, uh, Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree. When any time that, that I do 
the live practices, um, it, it's like things start showing up in my life differently those days and a few days after. And if I keep the practices going, then, then what I'm wanting continues to be magnetized to me. Um, and I've, in these workshops, I've practiced with my romantic partner and I've done a lot of practice with non-romantic partners. And it's very helpful to, to sort of get that feedback. It's like dancing. If you just learn to partner dance with one person, they're not going to see all of the ways that you're holding your body in funny ways or that as, you know, if I'm in the follow position that I'm back leading, um, that, you know, you need lots of different feedback. So in our, we're going to have um, one sort of taster night of like a, just an evening of these practices in Berkeley on April 26th, right? It's a Friday. And then we'll, we'll have an intensive soon after that. Uh, May 31st through June 2nd, so a Friday evening and then a whole Saturday and a whole Sunday also in Berkeley at beautiful Rudra Mandir, such a gorgeous space where we'll get to really dive in to, to these, these yogic polarity practices, finding, finding um, you know, how to, how to open our, our own bodies um, to to infinite love and to begin the practice, as Chris said, as Christopher said, it's a practice of a lifetime. I would say if you're wanting to find out, what's that? I was just going to say, if you're wanting to find out um, more about those workshops, you can, you can find them on either of our Facebook pages or or our websites, my, my website's embodiedrelationshiptherapy.com. And Chris, what's yours? Um, just well, my website is christopher.sanyata. christophersanyata.com. Okay. You can also go sanyata.info. Yeah. It's yeah. a way to get there. Yeah. You can find me on Facebook. Great, great. Yeah. Well, it was such a pleasure pleasure to get to it's always such a pleasure to talk with you Chris and so fun to to do this live likewise thank you so much for uh, setting this up and for anyone else who's listening to this after boards too know that um, when we're leading practices or workshops on this it's a profoundly safe place so you don't have to know how to do any of this beforehand we'll guide you into it and sort of like a you know a great amusement park ride right it you, it's it's exciting but i want you to know it's perfectly safe and we'll give you techniques so you can kind of take that sense of safety with you even when you're leaving afterwards because um, there's always this balance between i feel trusted and held and i also feel that edginess and that aliveness and this can be used in any other area of life. It just happens to touch most cleanly in our kind of sexual core a little bit. It's not like we're trying to make it all about sex, but that is kind of this enlivening central piece of all of our beingness that um, we just kind of crave and try to bring it out into the light more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the it's the life force energy. You know, sexual energy is life force energy. Freud talked about the libido in that way. So it's not just having physical sex. I think that's what we think of it. But when we're talking about sexual energy, we're talking about that energy that animates us, that created us, that will continue to create, that is the creative force within us. Something that puts a spring in your step, you know? I mean, look, look at Karen. She's Kind of happy right now you can you can feel when, when a feminine being is is kind of full of energy it makes the whole room light up right and you know if you're a man or a masculine being and you someone notices you or you feel you've had an energetic exchange it 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 nourishes you at a level more than even food and uh that's what a lot of this work is about and knowing that that is always accessible and, and once you learn how to access it, then you can continue to bring that in your intimate relationships. And it literally is possible to keep them 
growing and deepening over time, although that's not the common experience. So we're just trying to pay forward some mm -hmm. deep gifts we receive from our teachers. So come join us. Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, take care, everyone, and see you. See you next time. Thanks for showing up.